something that you, you held on to really tight. I remember a particular item that I had purchased 24 to 25 years ago that I held on to in a pocket like it was gold. Actually, it was gold. I bought it underneath the nose of my wife. It's the biggest thing I've ever done, and it's the biggest thing that I always remember because it's the only surprise I've been able to keep from it. So, <laughs> we were out on a date, I don't even remember. It was 24, 25 years ago. I don't, it might have been 26 years ago. I don't, do you remember? I don't remember. I just remember we were out at the mall, and we were, we'd already got engaged by that point, but I hadn't bought an axe. I mean, she had a ring. I think I paid $100 for it, if that. I was, and she lost it, by the way. <laughs> Actually, she let her niece wear it, our niece wear it, and our niece lost it. Carrie Beth lost it. Um, but, that's another story. But we were out, I bought her this really cheap ring, and we were out at the mall, we were getting ready to go to a movie, we were, you know, we were out on a date, and we, were, we stopped at Kay's. I don't even remember where it was. Cincinnati? Florence. Florence. Um, we stopped at Kay's, and she tried on these rings, she was trying on rings and looking at them, and one of them fit, it was the, I mean, it was actual, the right size, and everything, so we, we, I, you know, I got information from the people, it was all, you know, we wrote it down on a card, I had it all, you know, da da da, so we went out to the mall, and I said, I gotta go back and ask a question, well, I went back and bought the ring, and had it in my pocket, and I didn't want to take my hand off of it because I was afraid it was going to fall out of my pocket. That's the most money I had ever spent on anything in my life at that point. Yes. I think. That was before I bought my car. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, here I am, am walking through the mall and going to the movies and I've got my hand in my jacket pocket the whole time. Because I don't want to lose this. Right? That's what this slave did when the master came and brought him money. They didn't want to lose what had been given to them. They didn't want to lose that thing that they had been entrusted with. And here again we see Matthew going just one step too far, right? If he had just said there was a master who went on a trip and he gave money to his servants, and he gave five to one and two to another, and just be done with it. And then you've got one who makes ten, and one that makes two more. So you've got, you know, you've got one that slave that now has ten talents, and one slave that has four talents, and everything's good. And the master says, come with me into my, into my joy. Be a part of what's happening here. Because if you look at this passage, that's exactly the way it is. It's, the words don't change, right? There's a master who gave five to one slave, he gave two to another, and he gave one to the other. And then... After he's gone for a while, he comes back. And the one that had, had, had five earned five more. And when the, that slave came to the master, the master said, come into my, into my joy. Right? And then the one who had two earned two more. And, and the master says, come into my joy. Let's just end it there, Matthew. It's all about then being good stewards of what we've been given. And using those resources to help the master to obtain more. Right? That sounds good. Right? This, this means yes. This means... I really don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. I just don't get it. This is all about, it's all about using the resources that we've been given. Right? We had a long discussion Tuesday night at council about whether this was actually about money or about talents. Right? So my question to you then is, is this story really about money? Or is it about... Talents. Talents in the way of singing or playing or teaching Sunday school or cooking booyah. 
or insert gift you have here to use for the betterment of God's kingdom. So which is it? Is it money or is it... Yeah. Oh, all that stuff. <laughs> the answer is... Maybe. Because <laughs> you see, we have this story of this, this master who, who is joyful with those who use what they've been given and, and invites them into his joy. And then when this last one comes, and here's the other thing that we talked about on Tuesday night, about how you, know, you read this passage, and we don't really look at it that closely, but it's, you know, the master, the, this last servant says... Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter. I know that you do things that you're not supposed to. So I didn't want a chance even losing what you had given me. Where the other two had taken the initiative and gone out and earned more money, maybe because they just knew that's what the master wanted them to do. Maybe that's because that's what they wanted to do with the, with the money that they've been given. Or maybe they knew that they had something in them that they could use to help other people. And that's what motivated them to go and to do. But this last one says, I didn't want to do anything because I was afraid of what was going to happen from you. And remember last week when we talked about the king at the wedding banquet. And I said, you know, when we talk about parables, we always want to look at to see who, who actually is who in the parables. And we look at this parable and we go, well, is the master God? Is the master God? And if so, is God going to say, you worthless slave, why didn't you use what I gave you? Or at least do the least and take it to the bank to get a little bit? Is that the God that we want to see? That's why sometimes I wonder if Matthew doesn't go just a step too far. Last week with the wedding banquet, and, the, and the, the guy who didn't have the garment getting thrown into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this morning where we have these three servants and the, and the last one comes and didn't do anything with, the, with what the master had given him. And the master says, take it from him and give it to the one that has more. Because those who have will get even more. And those that don't have, even what they have is going to be taken from him. I, I'm sorry, that's not the God that I want to think about. That those who don't have even what they have, God's going to take it from them to give it to somebody else. That's not the God that I know. But what is this story actually about? You see, this story can, can get complicated. And this parable can create a conundrum for us. Because we all know, or at least I hope you all know, that God has given you something. The ability to sing, the ability to make booyah, the ability to, to cook, the ability to teach. Each of you has something that God has gifted you with that he's asking you to use in the world. And it's as if you can imagine you get the prettiest wrapped present you ever got in your life. It's the most beautiful box. The wrapping is perfect. There's, the edges are all creased correctly. The, all the things are taped down. The sides are all equal. It's all taped down. There's a beautiful ribbon around it. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's the perfect package. And it's your present. It's your gift. But you're so enamorated with the way that it's wrapped that all you do is you take that gift and you set it on the shelf. Have you actually received the gift? Have you actually taken that gift and, and made it part of who you are? One of the, the, the things I looked at this past weekend was a, or listened to it and look at it. It's a podcast, so I kind of looked at it on the screen as I listened to it. But um, it's a, it a podcast by some professors at Luther Seminary. And one of the professors, Ralph Jacobson, said something to the fact of, Grace that does not transform is not is grace not received. Grace that does not transform is grace not received. Meaning, I can give you the most perfect package and the most perfect present that you ever got wrapped perfectly, but if you never open the box, you didn't actually get it. That's what this passage is about this morning. The 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 is in this, in this parable 
The thing that we need to look at is the fact that this is a parable about us waiting for the return of who? Jesus. Confirmation says Jesus is the correct answer at this point. Jesus. Even the parable right before this, which is the parable of the ten virgins, or the ten women waiting on the bridegroom to come. It's all about being prepared and having the things that you need. It's about understanding that each and every one of us was gifted monetarily and with other things from God. And for us to use those gifts in a way that God wants us to. Use those gifts in a way that's going to build God's kingdom. Use them in a way that's going to let other people see the love that God has for each and every person in the world. Right? It's about us using what we've been given so that others see how much God loves each and every one of us. One of the last things we did at the council meeting on Tuesday night is um, Bruce was reading out of the CEB, which is a common English Bible. And he said he didn't really like that translation. So I told him to look up the message version. Normally I don't bring this Bible out. Um, but this is the message. It's by a pastor named Eugene Peterson, who is now no longer with us. Eugene Peterson was a Presbyterian pastor who translated the whole, the whole of the New Testament and the whole of the Psalms by himself into modern, easy-to-understand language. And then had a group of people help him do the rest of the Old Testament. But the passage this morning from Matthew chapter 25, particularly the one about the last servant. The servant given 1,000 said, Master, I know you have high standards and hate careless ways, that you demand the best and make no allowances for error. I was afraid I might disappoint you. So I found a good hiding place and secured your money. Here it is, safe and sound, down to the last cent. And the master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. If you knew I was after the best, why did you do less than the least? The least you could have done would have been to invest the sum with the bankers, where at least I would have gotten a little interest. I was struck by the line. If you knew I was after the best, why did you do less than the least? God knows what you can do. God has given you the gifts that you have according to your ability to use them in a way to show his love to the world. So to not use our gifts is doing less than the least. If you don't know what your gift is, ask somebody. They'll be able to tell you. If you think it's singing, talk to Clyde. <laughs> if you really don't know and you want to figure it out, come and talk to me. I'd be glad to talk to you about what your gift might be. And to help you use that in the world. Because that's what God is calling each and every one of us to do. It's not about showing up here and doing our, our weekly thing. It's about understanding whose we are and who we are in God. And going into the world to do what he's called each and every one of us to do. Because grace that has not transformed is grace that has not been received. So if your life is not transformed, have you really taken the gift that God has given to you? Because God has gifted you to share his love and that gift with all of the world.